Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our sixth lecture. Today we're going to talk about back propagation, which is this algorithm we use to train uh, neural networks. And we're going to talk about how to implement a very um, simple version of it today. And then in the assignment, in the next assignment, you're going to have to implement it for training a uh, multi-layer perceptron. OK? So just a couple of announcements. Our first assignment, the logistic regression one, is due this Monday. So if you haven't started, it's a good time to do it. And don't forget to submit it by the, the end of Monday, OK? Uh, and we don't have class this Monday. It's a holiday, so uh, you guys should take some time to rest as well during the long weekend. All right, so last lecture we talked about multi-layer perception and this idea of non-linearly separable problems. And we motivated MLPs with the XOR problem which cannot be solved by a linear model. But MLP is also the basis for the other, the other neural networks we're going to talk in, about in this course. And as usual, we talked about uh, how to compute the outputs of the model, which in this case we call uh, the forward pass. And uh, we discussed this idea of the hypothesis space for multilayer perception, which is the space of composite functions. Right. So depending on the amount of layers you have on your neural network, you're going to have more or less composite functions. So then uh, you can think that the hypothesis space for multilayer perceptrons is dependent on the amount of layers you have, um, because then you're going to be able to compose more or less functions. And at the end, we talked about the categorical cross entropy loss which is uh, this generalization of the binary cross entropy loss that we use to um, compute the loss in multi-class classification problems. All right, so for today, we're going to talk about training neural networks. And that's going to involve the gradient descent algorithm, which you already know. So nothing really changes there, um, at least the overall idea is exactly the same. What changes is how you compute the gradients. And that's the idea of the back propagation algorithm. It's an algorithm to compute the gradients of neural networks efficiently. Okay, so some people kind of get confused about these two things. They're clearly different. Gradient descent is an optimization algorithm, and back propagation is used to compute gradients. That's it. And backpropagation involves this idea of a computational graph, which is a data structure that runs or underneath this algorithm. And we're going to see examples of how to compute the gradients of logistic regression and a uh, shallow two-layer, multi-layer perceptron using backpropagation and this idea of computational graph. So we're going to do this only once. And then from this lecture on, you will be just using um, these ideas to actually implement them uh, in the next assignment. But once we are done with that assignment, then per we're going to just use uh, PyTorch. Then these ideas here would be directly implemented for you there. Okay, so we didn't see a slide like this last lecture, and I normally do that. So this is a summary of um, the gradient descent for, uh, this is a two-layer neural network, okay? So here's on the right-hand side on the top, right, you can see the 
hypothesis space, how you compute the, the outputs, y hat. And here I'm doing just for one example, x, so lowercase x with that bold notation, it's a vector, so that's only one example, it's not a matrix. So then this means that the y hat there is just a number, is one prediction for that example x. Also from now on, I want you to develop this idea of, or this ability of imagining the results of matrix and vector multiplications very quickly. So I think it's very useful as a, a deep learning engineer to be able to figure out the shapes of these matrices. Uh, so just kind of getting used to looking at a matrix multiplication and figuring out the size of the output. That's very, uh, so you know, for example, if the output is three by n or m by one or one by one, this ability is very, is very useful when implementing deep learning code and also like especially debugging what's going on. So here we see that because x is an input vector, vector our y hat there is a single number that gives a prediction. And here because I have that sigmoid at the very last equation, uh, we can guess that this is a binary um, classification problem. Okay, because this model is gonna give us a probability. Probability of, probability of y equal to one given x. And this is modeled by sigmoid of z2, which is the output of the second layer of this neural network. And because this is a binary classification problem, we're gonna use the binary cross entropy loss to measure the error of our predictions. So if you look at the optimized function there, it's essentially the same, right, as the previous ones we have seen. Now we have two, this, this new network has two layers, so it has two sets of W matrices and two Bs. And I'm using this init weights rand function just to encapsulate this idea of randomly initializing the weights close to zero, as we saw last lecture. So assume that that function is gonna return two W matrices and two B uh, vectors. <clears throat> Obviously you could have, you probably would pass the sizes of these uh, matrices as arguments to this init weights fu rand function. <clears throat> but then you have the gradient descent uh, for loop there, for t in range uh, from zero to the number of iterations. You're gonna do the forward pass, and the forward pass now is just running um, that two layer model there that we see on the top right. And then we compute the gradients, as usual, but now we don't know how to compute these gradients. And that's what you're gonna see in this lecture, okay? <clears throat> but once you get the gradients, then you can update the weights with the same idea as usual. So the question mark here is how do I compute, compute the, the gradients, right? DL, DY1, DL, DB1, DL, Y2, and DL, DB2. So, so far, we have been just computing the gradients by hand, right? In other words, we would go to the board, or I would just give you on the slides the equations or the derivatives um, <clears throat> calculated by hand. And then we would get these uh, derivatives or these gradients and just write them in the code, right? And this is, we did this for linear regression and logistic regression. We, com we computed these um, equations for the gradients by hand, uh, and they happen to be the same as we already discussed, even though the models and the losses are different. But 
moving forward, it's going to be very hard to do that. Or in practice, it's very hard to do that when you're dealing with very large models. First of all, it's very easy to make mistakes when you're doing uh, these derivations by hand. Obviously, well, you can, I mean, you have to do that only once, right, when you're implementing your code, but that's not quite right because if you happen to change your loss function, then you have to do the derivatives all over again. Or if you change uh, uh, a activation function in the middle of the model, then you have to compute, or to compute all your gradients again. So it's not very flexible. Uh, it doesn't allow one to just quickly experiment with different models, different activation functions very quickly. Uh, as we can do nowadays, uh, if you have already played or implemented a model in, in PyTorch or previously in TensorFlow, you could do experimenting very quickly because you didn't have to do that. You can just go to the code, compile your code or run your code on Python and, and that's it. You check your performance or you check if it works and then if it doesn't work, you just tweak the model and do it again. It's very quick, quickly, very quick to do that. But if you didn't have that, it would be very tedious and hard because you would have to compute the gradients by hand all the time. And people used to do that back in the day when neural networks weren't that popular. So there weren't, there weren't a kind of very strong motivation for building a PyTorch library because there were not many people doing neural networks uh, out there. But now there is a lot of people. So there is a lot of people also building cool libraries that help us. But backpropagation idea is not very recent. In fact, it's, it's a couple of decades old. But it's an idea to solve this problem, to actually compute the gradients of any model automatically. And that's what we're going to see today. So the backpropagation algorithm uses underneath it this data structure called compute a computational graph which is a directed graph that represents a generic or any mathematical operation. And this graph, in this graph, a node represents a function of its inputs, and an edge represents an argument. Okay, so here's an example, or there's two examples here. On your left-hand side, you see this equation or this function f of x, y, z, which is equal to x plus y times z. And we can represent this expression or this function using a computational graph as you see in this left-hand figure. We have these three leaves at, at the um, extreme left, x, y, and z, they are leaves in our graph. And then x, y flows through this first node, which does the plus operation, which in turn uh, returns this q value, which is a temporary value, right? That goes through a second node that is a multiplication node that takes the second leaf, z, or this third leaf, z, and does the multiplication, q, q times z. And that outputs the result f, OK? So this is a very minimalistic, let's say, um, way of designing a computational graph. Because we're just, because we're just using very simple uh, operations, plus and a multiplication. But you can put any function you want in a node. You don't have to be restricted to pluses and times and exponentials or any basic operation. You can define any function and plug and make a node out of it. So for instance, you, we could represent a logistic regression using a computational graph like we see uh, on the right hand side. Remember the function of the logistic regression is edge of wxb equal to sigma of wx plus b. So this image represents now the computational graph, which has th three leaves, w, x, and b, 
that now th these three leaves, they go through the first node, which does a more fancy operation. Not right now, this node actually already does a multiplication and a sum altogether. That's just a design decision. Right? We can do, again, a node is a function. You can write any function you want. Okay? And that function wx plus b returns a z value that goes through that second node that computes the sigmoid of z and gives the output h. Okay. So you can design any node you want with any function you want. How you choose the functions depends on your problem. And we're going to see that there is a pattern in your networks um, that's just convenient to use. OK, this is not that uh, complicated. But right now, we can use this computational graph to run the backpropagation algorithm. And formally, the, the backpropagation algorithm uh, uses a computational graph with the chain rule of calculus to compute the gradients of a given function f. And it has two steps. It has a forward pass uh, that compute the outputs of f, where f is your function that you want to compute the gradients. And uh, when you're doing the forward pass, we're going to store the partial results uh, in the nodes themselves. So here's an example. Consider x equals to minus 2, y equals to 5, and z equals to minus 4. Okay. These are our leaves. They are our inputs to the problem. Oh, on the bottom right there, you see the equation or the function we are considering in this example, f of x, y, z equal to x plus y times z, which is the same example as the previous slide. So you start by doing the forward pass. So basically, you're going to compute uh, first that q value there, which is 3, because 5 minus 2, right? And then you do the last computation, or you run the last node, which does q times z, which is 3 times minus 4, that is minus 12, OK? So we basically run this computation from the left to the right, OK? So far, nothing really hard. So just a couple uh, of notation here. I'm going to use this, it was supposed to be magenta color, uh, to represent the outputs uh, of the forward pass. And then on the backward pass, I'm going to use a blue color to represent the values uh, that we compute during the backpropagation step. So that's, that's it for forward pass. But for backward pass, now what you want to do is we're going to compute the derivatives of the output with respect to each input of our problem. So now we have three inputs, x, y, and z. And the goal here is to compute d, f, dx, d, f, dy, and d, f, dz. Okay. So that's what you're going to do uh, right now. So one key property of the backpropagation algorithm is that the nodes, they have to know how to compute their local derivatives. And what I mean by that is, is this. I'm going to give you an example. A local gradient or a local derivative for a node is the partial derivative of its output with respect to, to all of it, its inputs. So look at this example here uh, that we just saw. So that dashed line there represents that, that information you see on the, <clears throat> on the little square there is stored inside the, the, that node. So when you are defining an, uh, an operation, you have to also define how to compute its derivatives. At least it's local derivatives. That's how, how you call it. Which is, again, the partial derivatives 
of the output, which is f in this case, right, with respect to both its inputs, q and z. If there were more inputs, you would have to define uh, those um, partial derivatives as well. But here is very simple, right? We know that um, the partial derivative of f with respect to q is z, right? From the rules of calculus. And then the same for df dz, right? From the rules of calculus, I know that this derivative is equal to q. And we're going to do that for the second node as well. So now it's even simpler. We have two inputs, and our, our output is q, right? The output of this um, leftmost node here is the q value. So we're going to have to um, store in that node how to compute the derivatives of q with respect to x and q with respect to y. And the both of them will be 1, right? Because these, if I'm changing q with respect to x, right, then y doesn't play a role in that change. And the derivative of x is just 1, right? And the same for the partial derivative of q with respect to y. Then, in this case, x doesn't play a role in that derivative. So the, derivative, the partial derivative of q with respect to, uh, sorry, this derivative here would be 0. And then um, the derivative of uh, y would be 1. So both our uh, partial derivatives are very easy to define. And that's our job when we are creating a backpropagation um, engine, let's say. For every node that I add to my graph, I have to add the forward computation that it does, and also how to compute these local gradients. So I have to specify that for, in order for the backpropagation to work. Okay. And all right. So now, what is left to be done is use the chain rule to compute the partial derivatives of the final output with respect to the inputs. Our final output is f, OK? This is our final output. But I want to know these three here partial derivatives, df dx, df dy, df dz. Because essentially, I want to know if I change my input a little bit, how that's going to affect the final output. And intuitively, I have to use the chain rule here, because if I change y, for instance, that y is going to change q, that in turn is going to change f. So I have a composite function here. So if I change y, I'm going to change f through q. Right? So that's why we need the chain rule here. And that's a key um, idea for the backpropagation algorithm. And on the top right there, you see the chain rule um, that we saw a couple of lectures ago. All right, let's. <clears throat> compute now, start computing the derivatives of the final output with respect to each um, intermediate node. So our first step, which we call the base case of backpropagation, it's straightforward because we are computing the derivative of f, which is our output, with, with respect to, it, to itself, which is always 1. <clears throat> but now, we're going to traverse this graph using depth first search, or doing a depth first traversal, which means we're going to, from the output, we're going to go down, then go back and visit. So we're going to visit z, then go back, visit y, and then visit x. So the, that's how backpropagation traverses a computational graph. So 
Based on that, we know now that our second step is compute the, <clears throat> the derivative of f with respect to z. Okay. Well, but that's easy, right? Because we already know that derivative from our uh, first node on the right, it already knows how to compute df dz, which is equals to q, which is 3 in this example, right? You can see it here. OK, so now we finish there. We, when we reach a leaf, then we have to backtrack and go to the next node there and compute the derivative of the output of that neuron, which is q. So that is df dq. Okay, the third step here is the derivative of the final output with respect to this node here. And that's also easy because, again, our rightmost node here already has that um, derivative for us. So it's just df dq is equal to z, which is equal to minus 4. OK? z is minus 4 uh, because it's our input. OK? And now it starts to get interesting because now we have to go to y. Right? And the derivative of f with respect to y depends on this intermediate q node there. So here, by definition, the derivative of f respect to y is using the chain rule, right? Is dq dy times df dq. I'm actually writing this in an inverse order. Uh, if you uh, if you look at the definition of chain rule, we normally write df dg dg dx. So because then we follow the the way we write the function, right? The function is f of g of x. So then it makes sense to say df dg dg dx because if you change uh, x, right, x change, changes z g and then g changes f. Right? So normally you you write it this way, but here I'm actually writing the opposite way because we are analyzing, we are kind of looking at the, at the graph backwards. So it makes sense here that look at how this definition, df dy, actually uses df dq that we just computed. <clears throat> and then dq dy is, our, is also here, which is 1. So it's 1 times minus 4, right? dq dy is stored. It's, we know how to compute it from the, the, the leftmost node. So it's 1 times minus 4, which is minus 4. And what is left now is the last node on the top left which is the partial derivative of f with respect to x, which again, we're going to have to apply the chain rule because if I change x, I'm going to change f through q. So then the df dx is equal to dq dx times df dq. But again, look how df dq is computed from the previous step, 3, so we can reuse that value. And so is dq dx, because dq dx is also defined in the q node. So dq dx is 1 from, the, from that q node times df dq that we computed in the third step, which is minus 4. So then the result of the fifth step is also minus 4. And we got the, the partial derivatives with respect to, to our inputs by doing this process. So in summary, the backpropagation uses this computational graph as a data structure 
and it first does this forward pass to compute the outputs. And then it stores the outputs or the, of each operation in its respective nodes, which is the, the colors you see in magenta there. And, and then it, it does, after doing the forward pass, it does a backward pass, which goes from the right or traver traverses, more formally traverses the graph um, in a depth first traversal. Uh, so in here, it goes from the, the most bottom no, node first, right? And it goes, traverses the graph computing these local gradients that because of this order, we can reuse the, the, the partial derivatives in later operations. So if you do the derivatives this way, you're gonna, because, the, because of the structure of the graph, then you can, you can keep reusing these derivatives as you go up. And this makes the whole process um, more effective and very generic. Because now if you wanna be able, if, you're, if you wanna build a library like, like PyTorch that does auto derivation, essentially what you have to do is build a computational graph and run back, back propagation. That's all you have to do. The main work is you have to define all your operations and all the, the, the derivatives. But that's essentially what PyTorch does. Every operation you run in PyTorch, like a plus or minus, an exponential, or any function, or any loss function, uh, is defined somewhere um, and combined with its derivatives. So that's how PyTorch can auto-derivate uh, your, <clears throat> your loss functions. And I want to show you a very small implementation of that. So this is um, a collab I wrote today to demonstrate how this backpropagation gets implemented with PyTor, uh, with, sorry, pure NumPy. Um, and it's based on this project from Andre Carpati, which is a very famous deep learning um, person. He used to be the CTO for Tesla. Now it, it's running its own company. He was part of OpenAI in the beginning, then he came back, left OpenAI recently. And uh, he, so he's very known in the community. And he likes making videos on YouTube. I do recommend uh, all of them. And he also likes making tiny versions of deep learning libraries, such as this one that he calls Micrograd, which is a very minimalistic implementation of the backpropagation algorithm um, with a computational graph. So I took his implementation and made it even simpler for this class. But I do recommend you looking at this um, repository later. It's linked on this collab, which um, I'm gonna put on the website. But here it's an overview. So basically, we're gonna define a node to store, to store operations, but we normally don't call it a node because we wanna hide this idea of the graph, right? The graph is essentially the, the underneath data structure. For people who are using your, your library, they are dealing with mathematical operations, so they're dealing with values, right? So you normally call this a value, or in PyTorch, they call it a tensor. Okay, so it's your basic numerical representation. Um, you can define scalars, you can define vectors, you can define matrices, tensors with this. Uh, here, we're just gonna work with simple floats and integers. Um, so we can visualize the examples we did on, on, on the slides. But basically, there's this class value that we're gonna use to instantiate numbers. And it's special because now, when you create this object, you give a number, let's say five, and then all these other properties are set for you by default. Right? You're gonna store 
now because it's a node, it has children, so, but you don't have to know that, right? As a user of the library, you don't have to know that this is part of a graph, right? So this is all hidden. Whenever you see this uh, underscore here, it means it's a hidden, it was meant to be a hidden or a private property of, of that object. Since Python doesn't have that, it's the notation we use. Anyways, but you have the data, which is the number you want to create, and then uh, we also define the gradient of that node, which starts with zero. And we're going to define uh, two operations in our engine. Summation, which is add, and it's written this way because we are overriding the plus operator of, from Python. It's underscore, underscore, add, underscore, underscore, uh, because you want to override the, the plus operator. And the same for multiplication. We are de redefining these two operations for them to get integrated with our graph. And then we're going to do this backward function. I'm going to go over the, the whole, the whole uh, collab first, and then, and then we uh, discuss the, the details before, after. But the backward function is the function that traverses the graph using this depth first traversal, computing the derivatives uh, using the chain rule. That's it. So here is our depth first search. If you remember from uh, your graph course or your AI courses, You've seen this before, right? This is a simple depth for search algorithm. But what we're going to do is essentially I want to build a list with the search. I want to build a list that stores the nodes in the order of the traversal. So I, I, that function returns a list with Z. F, Q, Y, X. Because this is the order of the traversal I want. So at the end, you see that there is this top list here, topo list, which is for topology. And I keep adding, sorry, I keep adding to that list in depth first order. So at the end of this function here, when I call it here, sorry, and I call it for a node, you can think of this self here as this F node here. So I'm going to call it on the very last node and then do the traversal backwards. And then we have a base case for our, for our uh, chain rule, which is always one, because the derivative of the the output with respect to itself, it's always one. So we start um, the iterative process with one. And then we traverse that list um, in reverse order because, sorry, this is, gonna, this is gonna actually return, this function is gonna actually return the opposite order. It's gonna return x, q, y, oh, yeah, x, y, q, no, x, q, y, f, z. And then if you return it, if you reverse it, you get the right order. This is just an implementation detail, okay? But then I call this backward function on each, on each node and automatically I get all the gradients using the chain rule. And that's, that's it. So how does this backward function uh, work? So I have to define this backward function for each operation that I add to my graph. So if, here I only have two operations, sum and multiplication. So if you look at the sum implementation, there is a backward function associated with it. And if you look at the multiplication function, there is a backward uh, implementation for that as well. So let's look at the, actually let's look at the backward function for the multiplication um, operation. First of all, this is just to make sure. Um, so you want, when you are multiplying values, 
since our object stores some number, so this, the self here is an object of the type value, so it has a number, it has a value, let's say five. And I wanna multiply this number five by another number which we are calling other here. So let's say uh, this other has a value of two. So if I do in Python five times two, using the plus, the times operator, right, but five is, five is a value, or is an instance of, is instance of my class value, and the other number is not, I have to make sure that number is also a instance of my class. So this first line here, just make sure that the other variable is an instance of the value class. That's all it. If, it's, if it's, it was already an instance, then it, it doesn't do anything. It just returns itself. This if here only checks if other is an in instance of this value. And uh, if it's not, then it creates that object, otherwise it just keeps the same object. But now I compute the output of that operation, which is simply the self.data, which is my own data five, times the data of the other variable, which is two. So this, I'm gonna create a new value that stores the result of the forward pass. This is the forward pass of this value, right? Which I'm just using the basic times operation here. And here are the children of this operation. This operation takes as input myself and the other. Okay, so these are two children of this operation. And this little string here is just to print this node. I'm saying this is a plus, is a times operation. So I'm using the asterisk here. Uh, and then, Finally, we get the backward function. This is all print statements for us to visualize what's going on. Essentially, what you have to do is apply the chain rule. So this backward function does what it's here in each of these uh, little squares. Remember I told you when you are defining an operation in a computational graph, you have to define its um, the partial derivatives of the output of that, that node with respect to the, the inputs of that node. So it's a local, that's why I call a local gradient. It's the, you only have to do these local derivatives and then the algorithm kind of combines all these local, derivative, these local derivatives or, or gradients to compute the global gradient, okay? If you, if you wanna think this way. So it kind of separates the problem. I only have to compute or by, I only have to know how to do these derivatives by hand which are normally very straightforward because they are very tiny operations. Uh, if you're defining a complicated function, maybe that derivative is gonna be a little complicated, but still like normally you're doing these modules, these small modules that are typically easy to compute uh, the derivatives and, and that's the benefit or the beauty of, of using this as opposed to, to doing all the whole process by hand, the whole derivation process by hand. So this step, it's just the application of the chain rule. And, si and why is it that self grad is equal to other grad times out grad? So this out grad, this multiplication here is from the chain rule definition. So this is the, in this example, the, the multiplication you are looking at the code is this multiplication here and this multiplication here, okay? It turns out that for the multiplication operator or the multiplication node, the derivative uh, dq, d, oh here, this is the multiplication node, sorry. It turns out the derivative of the output with respect to the input q, I have two values, right? Q and z, q and z. Here in the code, you have self and other. So you can think of self as Q and other as Z, okay? So the partial derivative of Q, of F respect to Q is Z. In other words, the partial derivative of self, uh, of, of out with respect to self is the other. That's why it's other dot data here. 
This is from the definition of, this is from the, how you derive multiplication. Uh, and the other derivative is the other input, right? So the derivative of, of out with respect to um, other, which is z, is q, which is self in our code, OK? <clears throat> so again, this is applying the chain rule. And uh, this expression here is the partial derivative of the uh, multiplication. And this is, from, this is from one input, and this is from the other input. I have two inputs, self and other. So there is only two partial derivatives, derivatives I have to compute, and they're computed here. If I had more inputs, I would have, to, I would have more lines here. Okay. If I had only one input, I would have only one line here. Let's say the sigmoid function. It only has one input. So I only would have to compute one line here. Okay. Well, you guys are going to have the, the video later. I don't want to spend too much time discussing this code. So this is just to give you a, very, a quick idea of how this is implemented. You would have a very similar code for this plus operator. And now, look, at, you see these ones in here. Again, this multiplication times out is because of the chain rule. This is the, this is the times that you see in the chain rule. And this out.grad is always this second argument of the chain rule that comes from the, the output, uh, that flows from the output. And one is the de derivative of the sum. So for both inputs, the partial derivatives is one. So that's why you see one and one here. Okay. And that's it. So if I, if I wanted to have a third operator, let's say if I wanted to have or allow, if I wanted to have a, let's say, a sigmoid, sigmoid node, I would have to do the same, implement the same idea. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> yeah, it's actually doing everything by itself. So, um, so the output would be just a value. So I don't have the other the other element here, because sigmoid only takes one input, right? So I'm going to compute. This is the, the forward pass of the sigmoid function, which is the definition of sigmoid function. Right? And the z, the, c argu the z argument of the, the sigmoid function is just self.data, which is the value I'm storing in this object. Okay, And then I'm using the sigmoid um, string here to, to define what this operation is. And my only input is self. So this is my uh, single child. And then I have to do a backward, a backward function for this node, sigmoid, which it, by definition, we know that the derivative of the sigmoid function is this. It's 1 minus y times y. That's by just doing the derivative by hand of this function. But that's all you need to do if you want to support a new operation in your graph. All right, and that's all that we need. So I'm going to run this, but now I can do a simple forward pass here. So this is just the definition of the function, but this is how you use this library. You have to, now instead of doing stuff like this that you normally define in Python, right? You normally define your variables like this, but if you do it this way, then you don't get your values in the graph. But if you do it like this, then automatically for you now your values, they go in a graph. And any operation you do with these numbers are going to be tracked in this graph. So if I do, for example, forward of x, y, and z, see how I'm doing this summation and multiplication. but Remember, these operator, operators here, they have been overwritten by these functions. So even though you're writing plus and times, the, the function that is being called is this. Because those are values. They are in, instances of values. So 
this is the function that gets called. But if I get the forward pass, then again, this is going to do compute the output f. And then I can do just f dot backward, because f now is, is a value. It's a node. So I can do backwards from this node and compute the partial derivatives of each node in the graph. Uh, but I'm normally interested in the leaves, which are the inputs, right? In this case, x, y, and z. So remember that from this is the computation we did on the slide. So this forward pass is exa exactly what we see on the slides. So the value of f uh, depends on how you change q. And because of that, to compute the derivatives, we need to run uh, back propagation with the chain rule. But that's it. You just have to call this f dot backward, and then boom, you get all your, your gradients. Okay? And that's it. Uh, I'm going to remove some print statements for now. You can bring them back later if you want to look or debug what's going on and make sure the computations are right. Let me, make uh, let me just start session and run all just to make sure. OK. But now I do the back propagation. And I'm actually, I don't even need this. I don't think it's, I don't need to return anything. It's not even returning anything. It's just doing this print here. <clears throat> so this prints, you see, values, they are the order of the traversal. So I first went to minus 12, which is this node, computed the gradient of it, which is 1. It's here. Then we, you came here to z. That's minus 4. And the gradient is 3. So it's here. Now we, we came here to q. The values of the output is 3. Remember, I stored this, all these partial, uh, these intermediate outputs. <clears throat> Value is 3, and gradient is minus 4. It's here, correct. Now I go to 5 uh, here, 5. The gradient is minus 4. And now I go to minus 2. And the gradient is minus 4. Okay, So it all um, uh, matches. So it's correct. And here are the final gradients. OK. They are exactly right. There's no approximation here. That's the, that's the exact gradients. OK, uh, that's all we needed to know to kind of, this is the whole idea behind back propagation. All right, so, so now uh, I want to show another example which is more concrete uh, for us, because that was a toy example, right? Uh, what we want to do is actually compute the gradients for a loss function with, with respect to parameters of a net neural network. That's why you're going to need backpropagation. Backpropagation is actually a more general algorithm to derivate any mathematical operation. But it's very handy to optimize loss functions in the context of neural networks. Uh, and here is an example. This is probably the simplest example we could do with, with neural networks, which is a single neuron. Remember that we can represent a logistic regression in a single neuron. And there is only one input feature. On the bottom right here, you see a tiny example there, x, y equal to 51. So th remember from our, you can bring back that example of tumor classification, malignant versus benign. 
and 50 could be the centimeter, like the size in centimeters. So, and if it's 50 centimeters um, a big, then it has, it, it is malignant, one. So if we only have one input feature X, then we only have one weight W and one bias term B. You see the equation on the top right, that's the definition of logistic regression. Uh, y hat equals to edge of x, that is equal to 1 over 1 plus e to the minus wx plus b. That's the uh, logistic regression neuron. And since this is a classification problem, and it's a binary classification problem, we're going to use the BCE loss, or binary cross entropy loss, which is defined by that. Uh, the two by that equation there. The two arguments are uh, y hat and y. y hat is our prediction. y is our true label, which is 1 in this case. And then, so the BC, BC loss is minus y times log of y hat plus 1 minus y uh, log 1 minus y hat. Okay. So let's run back propagation on this example now. So first step is forward pass. We normally initialize our weights with zeros, right? So we're gonna, our first run on the logistic regression, our first forward step would have W and B equal to zero. So then if I run that first node there, the leftmost uh, node, that would give a Z value of zero as well because 0 times x is 0 plus b, which is 0, that's 0. And then I run the middle node, which is sigmoid of 0. And remember, this, if you remember the shape of the sigmoid, um, that's going to give us 0 0.5. Uh, and in fact, this is also a very interesting uh, property of, of logistic regression, right? That it makes sense, right, that when you were running your first example with W and B equal to zero, that 50% chance makes a lot of sense, right, because the model is completely uncertain about that prediction. It doesn't know anything so far about your, your data, so the best it can do is guess 50, 0 0.5, right? So it doesn't know anything about the data yet, or specifically about this example. It doesn't have, you don't have to initialize the weights with W, uh, but that's interesting when you initialize it with zeros. Anyway, if you run then the last node, you don't have to worry about this number, 0 0.69, but I, I did the math and if you calculate, if you plug 0 0.5 as your Y hat and one as your Y, in that BCE loss function, you get approximately 0 0.69, okay? Anyway, so this is the forward pass, and then your algorithm will store these values in each of these nodes. What time is it? Okay, I, and then I, I was planning to do this um, by hand on the board, but I think I'm just gonna, uh, show it to you. Remember, first thing we do as part of our backward pass is define these local gradients. Remember, is the gradient, uh, is the partial derivative of the output with respect to the input. This rightmost node only has one input, so I only have one partial derivative, which is the partial derivative of L with respect to Y hat, and I'm giving the, the, that derivative to you. It's not very hard to compute. You just pick the loss function, that definition of BCE loss, and derivate it with respect to y hat. Using the rules of calculus, you get this expression. Okay. And then you're going to do the same for the middle node. And again, now you're, you're going to have to compute the derivative of your output, which is the sigmoid, uh, with, with respect to the input, which is z 
Uh, and remember, we've did this many times. We probably already memorized this, this, this derivative. That the deri derivative of the sigmoid is 1 minus y hat times y hat, or 1 minus the argument times the argument. Uh, <clears throat> and then you're going to also compute the partial derivatives of your last node there. Now this node has two inputs, so you need two partial derivatives, dzdw and dzdb. And this is, I think this is, these are easy ones for us to, to do it, right? So dzdw, b, the, the derivative of b is 0, right? Then derivative of w is 1, and I'm, I'm left with x. So this one is x. And dzdb is also easy, because then the derivative, the derivative of b is 1, and the other derivative is 0. So then uh, I just store these two partial derivatives there, and that's all I need to do. Right? So if I'm implementing this in, in, in my computational graph code, I would have to define this operation, which again is useful to have, because we're going to do this linear combination of weights uh, and inputs a lot in neural networks. Essentially, every neuron has that. So this is a very useful node to have in your, in your graph. Right? And again, and the derivatives are very easy. So this, this is easy to, to implement. This one is also we already have implemented in there. It's in the comments. We, we didn't implement a loss function, but we're going to have to, if, if you want to have, um, we're going to have to do that. We're going to need loss functions in our graph. So for every loss function you, you need, uh, you're going to have to implement a, a function there in your graph or a node there in your graph to compute that loss and then store the partial derivatives. OK. So now we are left with the backpropagation step. So f remember, you're going to have to traverse this graph from the right to the left, from the bottom to the top. So I'm going to start with this part, so dl, d, dl, which is the base case and is always 1. Uh, so that's not hard. And then I would have to do dl, dy, and then do dl, dz, and then later dl, db, and dl, dy. OK? So all I have to do is compute these five partial derivatives, um, which are, again, the partial derivatives of the loss function with respect to what I want is the loss function, the steps four and five. Because I want to know, if I change my input by a little bit, how much of that changes my loss function. Because I want to tune these parameters. Right? So I want to know that. And now my W and B op operations, they, they really depend on this chain of computation to get to the loss function, which means I'm going to have to use the chain rule. And here is the um, results. Base case is very simple. DL, DL is 1. This one is very simple as well, because DL, DY hat, we already have it stored in uh, our loss node. So it's minus y over y hat plus 1 minus y over 1 minus y hat. Then we go to the third step, which is the first one you're going to actually use the chain rule. <clears throat> but then dl dz is dy hat dz dl dy hat. And you, have, you probably already picked the behavior here. Now this, notice how this dl dy hat was computed in the previous step. So I already have this stored. And I can just multiply that previous gradient with uh, this one, which is defined in my node. OK? So I, and if you do the math, right, this gradient dy hat dz is, is this one we defined in the second step, which is in parentheses, times the derivative of dy hat dz which is y hat 1 minus y hat. And that is equal, if you uh, uh, simplify this expression, you're going to get y hat minus y. And remember, this, you already 
saw something similar before because we actually already knew the derivatives of the logistic regression from the previous lectures. But that's not exactly the, the final step. So we need to go to the fourth step, which is actually one of the interesting ones, because that's what, what we need, right? We need the LDB to update the gradient in our gradient descent algorithm. But again, this is just applying the chain rule. <clears throat> there is DZDB, DLDZ. And I remember that the second term, DLDZ, comes from the previous, uh, the previous step three. And if, so we say it flows back from uh, the output to the input B there. Uh, and then if you just, DZDB is uh, defined in the Z node, is one of the partial derivatives defined on the blue uh, rectangle there. So that's just one. DZDB is just one. So we are left with DLDZ, which you already know from step three, which is Y hat minus Y. And that's the final gradient for DLDB, which we know we need to, to use to update B in our gradient descent. And that's exactly the expression we use in our code, the code you implemented uh, in the assignment. OK? And the same for final step, DLDW is DZDW, DLDZ. DLDZ is the same we use in step four, which comes from step three, right? It's the second term of the, multiple, of the chain rule there. And DZDW is stored, again, uh, in the Z node, which is equal to X. So finally, our DLDW is equal to X uh, times Y hat minus Y. And that's exactly the gradient we use also in the programming assignment, OK? I know this is maybe a little tedious to watch. I think it's more interesting to do the math yourself and convince yourself that you understand what's going on, because it's easy to kind of like just follow me saying stuff. But uh, when I was doing this, and I did this many times, and it's still like it's not trivial. I've done this since, I don't know, like, First time I did this was probably 15 years ago. Not, no, maybe 10, I don't know. But it's still hard for me. But every time I do it, I kind of like get it in a different way and I get more convinced about the idea. So I'm not asking you to trust me. Actually, it's best to run and do the math yourself and get other expressions and try to compute the gradients uh, of other expressions and convince yourself that it, this actually works. And it's going to have this behavior of uh, flowing these gradients and reusing the, the, the partial derivatives uh, with this chain rule idea. Well, any questions and comments? I'm going to finish. Uh, this is the last slide. Uh, I'm going to finish soon. <clears throat> this is, uh, again, this is just a more complicated model, but it's the same idea. This is a multi-layer perception model with two layers. And if you look at this uh, first half of the graph, is the same as the previous one. Right? You still have this loss node. The loss node is the same loss because I'm also considering the same classification example. Uh, now, my, my x here has two input features, so it's a little bit more complicated. But if you're using the uh, matrix vector notation, the equations boil down to the same thing. Um, so on the top there, you see the model, the MLP model. It was model of two layers. Right? We have layer one that starts, that is A1 equal to G1, Z1, where Z1 is W on X plus B1. And the output, uh, our second layer is our output layer. And it outputs Y hat, which is equal to sigmoid. So now, again, it's a binary classification problem. So I still get that sigmoid there. But the sigmoid now is computed uh, over Z2, which is equal to W2 A1 plus B2. And 
So I, the ID is the same. So the first node is the same. The second node now is very similar to the previous uh, one because it's sigmoid of Z2. Before it was sigmoid of, uh, of Z only. And now I have the linear combination of weights uh, and inputs uh, here. But the inputs here are A1, which are the activation of the first layer. So that's the point where the graph gets longer, gets bigger. Now I have that top right, that top right node there, A1 equals to G of Z1, and that extra Z1, um, W1X plus B node. But what is the goal here? I need to compute the, again, the partial derivatives of L, which is my loss function, with respect to W1, B1, W2, and B2. Again, I want to know if I change these inputs, how much they change my loss function. So the longer the chain of operations, right, the longer your graph and the more complicated it gets to do the, the gradients. But remember, because now we isolated the problem, now we have to compute, first of all, the partial derivatives of each node or the local gradients as we, we are um, <clears throat> naming them. So the local gradients are the partial derivatives of that node output with respect to its own inputs. So let's, let me show you that for you. I'm not going to go over all of them because you're probably tired of this. But what is interesting here is that, well, the very rightmost node here has exactly the same local gradients because nothing has changed there, right? Is the DLDY hat. And the same happens with our second right node there, which is dy hat dz2, which again, the gradient of the sigmoid function. Or, and then now going to this middle node, z2, is the same idea. Now we have a linear combination of inputs and weights. And it's just now that you are doing derivatives with vectors and matrices, which, well, it isn't that uh, complicated. Uh, but you're going to get very similar gradients as well. Here, the derivative of z2 with respect to a1 is just w2, right? Because b2 is 0, a1 is 1, and then you get b2. And dz2, dw2 is a1 um, transposed. Because uh, this is just because of vector uh, operations. But again, w2 goes to 1, b2 is 0, and then you get a1 transpose. And dz2, db2 is equal to 1, because this first term, the derivative of that first wa1 term is 0, and then b2 is 1. So you do that, and then you do. I want to actually talk about this A1 node because here is interesting. Notice that I have a G function there that is not defined because we can pick any activation function. Okay? In this hidden layer. So that computation there is still kind of to be computed. So I, I am DA1, DZ1 is DA1, DG, DG, DZ1. So to, to actually compute that derivative, you need to define your G. OK? Uh, <clears throat> and then normally when you're writing a multilayer perception code, you, you can have an if statement, say like if it's sigmoid, if it's depending on, on, on the type of uh, activation function you use, you're going to pick one, uh, one of these two, one of two or three um, partial derivatives. You're going to actually have that computed already uh, or defining a function, and then you use an if statement to pick the, the right one. And then dz1, dw2, and dz1, db2, D, db1, sorry, dz1, dw1, dz1, db1, one at the left leftmost node, they are computed that way and follows the same idea of that middle neuron there, n node 
sorry. Okay, to finish, what is left is doing the back propagation. So we're gonna have to compute all these uh, partial derivatives of the loss function. So you're gonna see all these steps have dl on top, and then our base case is dl dl, which is one always. dl dy hat is the same as logistic regression, we saw that, is right here. Um, and then this middle node is the same as well, dl dz2 is also y hat minus y. This is essentially, this part here is essential a logistic regression, right? Combined with another hidden layer. So these steps one, two, and three, they don't change. But now steps four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, right? We have to compute them. And I left it blank there for you to do it, okay? Uh, I strongly encourage you to compute these uh, by yourself, knowing what we did on the slides. And if you get stuck, it means you didn't understand what's going on, right? So it's a good signal for you to know if you are comfortable with this or not. If you can't compute these gradients, then please come ask questions. We can try to do this together or uh, um, group with your friend or, or, and, and try to do it together. Um, but try to compute steps four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine by yourself. I'm gonna upload these slides um, later tonight. So make sure to do that. And then in a couple of days, I'm gonna update the this, this slides with the actual answers so you can check your work, okay? Um, and you're gonna use this idea to implement your assignment. You, you're not gonna have to do, so what the code is gonna do for you is do the steps one to nine. That's like your algorithm is gonna do that. You're implementing backpropagation exactly for that reason. But in your code, you're gonna have to write the, um, the partial derivatives or the local gradients. So you're gonna have to type these functions in there, okay? Um, and, and so this slide is very important. And it's important to understand this at this time, at, at this time of the course because moving, moving forward, we're gonna just use these ideas and we're not even gonna talk about uh, derivatives anymore. When I say gradients, we're just gonna have to imagine this happening uh, in, in the network. Okay, so that's all I had. So our next lecture is not this Monday, it's gonna be the upcoming Wednesday next week, and we're gonna talk about evaluating deep learning models. We're gonna discuss metrics, generalization, how to like analyze learning curves, um, how to validate uh, with small data sets uh, with cross-validation, confusion matrix, and other ideas, okay? All right, thank you, and see you next week. Enjoy your holiday.